asking, uh, I didn't get a chance to, to respond how the weather was. I, I can inform you it's rather cold and I didn't have any gloves as I was waving down the, the police um, who were already responding to the, the, the alarm and it seems like there's no issue in the building, uh, but I didn't tell them what office I'm in. So there's a chance they could be doing some sort of rounds where we get a little interruption, but, but hopefully not. So hopefully uh, no more interruptions. Uh, and thank you so much uh, for being here. Uh, so I guess you've heard a little bit about me, and so we'll just get into this. Um, there we go. Uh, so I want to just start by thanking uh, Anthony Carreras, the first friend to sort of reach out uh, for the invitation for this talk, but also John Barr for, for, for organizing, and Jennifer Martinez for, for a little help on the back end, and of course to Lone Star College for supporting this lecture series, and to everyone uh, for being here and you know, sticking out a few minutes uh, Fire alarm delay. Uh, I guess maybe somebody didn't want to hear the talk so much uh, they, they called in a uh, 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 an alarm or something, right? <laughs> well, one anyway. one participant said that Marco Anaros in the Free Navy had temporarily taken over. Well, his his time uh, is limited, um, but we'll probably not get to get to Marco in this talk because um, I want to try to avoid getting into too much that's season five since it's still current. But anyway, all right, so. My, my main objective here is actually a pretty modest one. Uh, I'm really just going to try to convince you that there's room for improving how we understand uh, the importance and value of space exploration and how we identify what space exploration projects are the ones, you know, worth pursuing and which ones we should maybe, you know, forego for the time. Uh, and maybe somewhat unusually for a philosopher, I'm not going to do this by sort of, you know, uh, looking into great detail at some specific foe's arguments and knocking that foe down premise by premise. Don't get me wrong, those are things I like to do as a philosopher, but in this talk, I want to do something a little bit different. And in particular, what I'd like to do is use the expanse as a way of, you know, prompting this reflection that I think we ought to engage in about um, what's important about space exploration, especially within American culture, because I think the expanse is very strongly speaking to the ways that Americans think about space. Uh, and so how am I going to do this? Well, I'm going to start just by giving you some information about uh, the expanse itself. I'm going to assume that not everyone in the audience here has seen the show. So I need to say enough about its background for, for things to make sense. And in particular, I'm going to be uh, interested in the culture of the Mars Congressional Republic, the MCR, so the Martian Society in this universe. Uh, and once I'd say a bit about that, I'll provide some examples of how sort of, you know, Americans speak about space exploration to point out some what I think of a, as important similarities. Uh, and then from here, we'll just look at a small number of philosophical ideas that I think are ones that can be very helpful uh, for trying to think about what might this comparison mean and how might it affect our decision making into the future. So, so this is much more about sort of promoting the virtue of a kind of philosophical approach to thinking about space than it is identifying a specific conclusion or a specific worldview to adopt. Uh, so, what about the expanse? Hopefully, a lot of us have seen a lot of it or read the books, but uh, if you haven't, um, it's a really fascinating uh, hard science fiction show. If you're not familiar with that term, hard science fiction refers to science fiction that you know pays some amount of basic respect to the laws of physics, so we try not to break uh, the laws of nature in hard science fiction, although advanced alien technology, which seems magical, is nevertheless permitted. Um, and the show is currently, at least the television series, is currently airing its fifth season. I think the ninth episode is going to be dropping for Amazon Prime subscribers late tonight, um, and I'll be watching that later tonight. Uh, but it's based on a, a pretty long-running book series by Daniel Abraham and Todd Frank, who published jointly under the, the pen name James S.A. Corey. And in this image here, we see the sort of central, the main protagonist of the series. Um, James Holden is the one front and center, and then next to him is Naomi Degata. Uh, and next to her is Alex Kamal, uh, and then Amos Burton off on the left. Um, both uh, Holden and Burton are from Earth, although they find themselves living very far away from Earth. Uh, Naomi Nagata is a child of the asteroids, and Alex Kamal is a son of Mars. 
uh, and they all end up uh, together as one imagined, you know, rag tag type shows. Um, and I think the expanse is so interesting to me because it's so subversive. We're so used to science fiction romanticizing space and romanticizing the future that it's very unusual to see something that really tries to depict what a lot of folks think actually living in space might be like, where things are very sort of dark and gritty, where um, we always have to worry about having access to the basic necessities of life, like oxygen and water. Uh, and so in contrast to, you know, universes like Star Trek, where our expansion into space comes with all kinds of societal progress, uh, the premise of the expanse is that we can go into space and make our problems worse by doing so. And that's not just an idle science fiction hypothesis. That's something that a lot of scholars feel uh, seriously engage with. Uh, Daniel Deedney just published a wonderful book called Dark Skies, uh, where he explores you know, reasons to be concerned about these sorts of issues. Uh, but you know, basically what the expanse is, is trying to, to get across is that space is not a, a sort of magic button that we can press to solve all of our problems. Uh, and I think that's important to reflect on here because these wider societal issues that the expanse portrays, uh, they're not just background deep, they actually drive not only the wider geopolitical story arcs in the series, but also the individual character story. Arcs. I'm going to focus more on the sort of wider geopolitics kind of stuff, but there could be versions of this talk that dig into the details of specific you know, characters. I'm thinking of folks like Bobby Draper, uh, Clarissa Mao, uh, you know, folks who are going to end up demonstrating the kinds of intellectual virtues that, that I want to you know, discuss in, a, in this talk. Um, so let, let, let's turn to the sort of you know major cultures of the expanse. And the biggest divide we find here is going to be between uh, the sort of inner culture comprised of Earth and Mars and the outer or the belter culture, which basically comprises all of the societies that exist somewhere beyond the orbit of Mars. So a lot of the population is going to be in the asteroid belt where Tycho uh, Station and Ceres Station are. Of course, Ceres Station is just a station on the dwarf planet Ceres. Um, but you've got uh, inhabitation uh, of the sort of Jovian and, and Saturn moons uh, and, and just all of these random little places. And there are all kinds of really fitting analogies that we're already familiar with that can help us understand how these cultures relate to one another. North versus South, so Earth and Mars are the North. Uh, the belt is the South, West versus East. Uh, first world versus developing world. These are all analogies that, that we can really run with. Um, but I guess uh, some things I'd like to just maybe observe about them. So Earth uh, is going to sort of be the oldest, most mature culture, as it were, uh, but it still has lots of problems. Most of its citizens live on basic assistance, not because they're not capable of getting jobs, but, but because there just aren't enough jobs for all, all, all of, of the people of Earth. Uh, Mars, uh, on the other hand, um, they're dedicated to sort of major societal goals, but since they're living on Mars, they don't have, you know, freely available water and oxygen, so they have to live underneath domes on the Martian surface. One of the largest places to live on Mars is the domed up uh, Valles Marineris, or they call Mariner Valley in the show, which is that big, um, I was about to say crater, but I should say, uh, why can I not think of the relevant term, uh, for Canyon, yes, there we go. Uh, you know, a canyon, basically the length of the continental United States. But then all of the delta cultures are completely contained with, you know, sealed habitats. Uh, and, and they are sort of ever at risk at running out of water and oxygen. And if you don't have oxygen, you're dead within seconds. So one can imagine what sort of stress it might, uh, what sort of stresses might be involved in, you know, being a wage laborer in the belt, where, you know, if you rest for a moment, maybe you don't make the quota and thus don't have enough money to buy oxygen for yourself for the next few days. Um, so there's a lot of things we could point to here, but I, I really kind of want to focus on Mars in particular. And so we're going to kind of set the belt to the side in this talk, even though I think the belter cultures are uh, fascinating in their own way. So when we think about these two superpowers, Earth and Mars, um, how do these compare with one another? Well, Earth is going to have the most stable access to resources, especially water. Virtually every other place in the solar system, Mars included, has to sort of, you know, pay belters to mine water from asteroids. So there's a lot of sort of resource supply concerns that, that arise at plot Um, But Mars, on the other hand, uh, is going to sort of have the edge compared to Earth in science technology. And of course, it devotes a greater share of its 
uh, societal resources with the military expenditure. But the real defining feature of that Martian culture is that they're all uh, working in support of this multi-century project to terraform Mars. And we can see uh, a sort of simulation of the results in that bottom right image compared to present day Mars in the, in the top image. Um, and that's about a century away at this point uh, in the Martian time. Uh, and so, you know, Earth and Mars are sort of have comparative military powers. It's left unclear early in the series if there would be a war between them. Who would win? You know, Earth has more, uh, you know, Navy vessels, but Mars uh, had, you know, better technology on their vessels. And I think a really interesting bit of history for the MCR, and this is mentioned in the show briefly. I believe there's a novella that explores the actual events. I have not yet read that novella. Um, but we learn uh, that the MCR sort of began life as a, a colony of Earth, as every space society probably would have at that point, right? Where else are the humans coming from? Um, and Mars only gained its independence by fighting a, a successful war of independence against Earth. And you know what I think that means? I think that means rather than Earth, it's Mars. That's the sort of America of the expanse. But if we want to try to draw sort of societal analogy, I think a really fitting one would be to imagine we're back, I don't know, around the, the twilight of British naval supremacy in the lead up to the First and Second World Wars, where, you know, America's developing its military might, but it's not yet overtaken the British Empire. And so I think viewing sort of the UN, Earth, as the British Empire and Mars as the United States is going to be pretty faithful to the kinds of conflicts and, and cultural sort of disagreements that we see between Earth and Mars. And instead of just claiming that, let's you know justify it a little bit. So I want to give you a couple uh, you know examples of Martians or aspiring Martians talking about Martian values. And one of the first good examples we see of this in the show comes from Franklin de Graaf, who's Earth's ambassador to Mars. So he's not himself a Martian, but he plans to retire on Mars. Sort of considers himself a member of Martian culture. Uh, and he'll say this uh, while he's speaking with uh, UNN. Under, uh, I forget her title at that point, but it's a conversation in, I believe, season one with Ava Sarala. You know what I love most about Mars? They still drink. We gave up. They're an entire culture dedicated to a common goal, working as one to turn a lifeless rock into a garden. We had a garden and we paid it. And when he talks about that common goal, he's referring to the terraforming project. So, you know, Mars has this, this singular project that organizes and energizes the entire culture. And that's just so sort of motivated. Um, this one takes a little bit more context. So this occurs in, uh, again, another season one episode where our main cast, our main characters uh, are being interrogated by the Martian Navy under suspicion of, uh, of destroying an ice faller from the belt. Uh, they, they were crew on the vessel, but not actually guilty of it. Anymore, we'll give, give too much away if you haven't seen the show. Um, and so this is when uh, James Holden, the sort of main protagonist, is being interrogated by the MCRN. The N in MCRN is Navy, so Martian Congressional Republic Navy. Uh, so Lieutenant Lopez is saying these things as uh, he's interrogating Holden. And I have to move something here so I can actually see what I wrote. Um, so when you spend your whole life living under a dome, as the Martians do, even the idea of an ocean seems impossible to imagine. I could never understand your people. Why? When the universe has bestowed so much upon you, you seem to care so little. We're nothing like that. The only thing Earthers care about is government handouts. Free food, free water, free drugs, so you can forget the aim of lives you lead. You're short-sighted, and selfish, and it will destroy you. Earth is over, Mr. Holden. My only hope is that we can bring Mars to life before you destroy that too. Now, I could provide a lot of other examples. Uh, much of them will be more offhand moments when you can hear like a, a Mars Admiral joking about cleansing the belt of pirates. Um, just there are multitudes of uh, similar examples one could provide. But if I had to sort of use a word to describe what I'm seeing happen here, I think it would be Martian exceptionalism. And if I had to define what are the features of this Martian exceptionalism, I think it would involve something like, you know, a dogmatic or an unquestioning, uh, you know, adherence, uh, the idea that, you know, Martians are just superior to all other humans, that all the others are inferior, they're free riders, 
They don't have a vision for the future, and they need to rely on Mars's vision to make progress for all of humanity. Uh, and what comes with this is a belief that Mars is, in essence, entitled to use its power however it wants in the solar system, and that everyone else should be grateful for that, grateful for the security Mars provides as it sort of polices the shipping lanes of the belt, uh, grateful for the stability it provides by imposing its military might and, and controlling it. Um, now, I happen to think that this Martian exceptionalism is uncomfortably similar to American exceptionalism. And that's kind of not by accident because the writers of the book series and the writers of the television series are contemporary humans living in the current day and age, and they only have so many examples to draw from. But I think it should be doubly unsurprising for people who have been paying attention to how we already have been talking about space. Uh, I think there are remarkable similarities between the culture of Mars and the Expanse, indeed a lot of the other cultures in, in the Expanse, but also, uh, but nevertheless, with Mars and American sort of space enthusiasm and space advocacy. So I want to walk you through some examples here. And the history of American space advocacy is a complex affair involving a lot of figures. Uh, one of the central moments in, in its sort of current formulation maybe starts with Werner von Braun in the post paperclip post World War II world, where he's partnering with you know Walt Disney trying to figure out how to sell the space program to America, and a lot of the things we believe about space are things that you know von Braun came up with as ways to get Americans to, to pay money for rockets. Um, and Kennedy famously was no fan of space. Um, it's well documented among historians that space was just this expediency for him, that, that he saw it as a very valuable political tool, but he had no inherent interest in it himself. Nevertheless, he really sort of hits the pulse of America uh, with, with the rhetoric he employs. And this is from the, the Rice University uh, moon speech, the second of the two famous moon speeches. And uh, one of the places in it will say this, that those who came before us made certain that this country rode the first waves of the Industrial Revolution, the first waves of modern invention, and the first waves of nuclear power, and this generation does not intend to founder in the backwash of the coming age of space. We need to be a part of it. We need to lead it. The vows of this nation can only be fulfilled if we in the nation are first, and therefore we intend to be first. So notice the stress on why um, it, it's constantly stressing that America needs to be the leader in space. Otherwise, you know, there, there's this great danger. And again, you can sort of see how Martians sort of view themselves as the sort of, you know, natural um, leaders of other planets. Um, bringing things a little closer to the present, there's the National Space Society, which is the largest space uh, advocacy organization in the U.S. And in their statement of philosophy, they they have this to say about you know the human expansion of the space that it will provide the human species with a new frontier for ed, uh, for exploration and adventure and the thought and expression culture and art and modes of government the opening of the new world to western civilization brought about an unprecedented 500 year period of growth and experimentation in science technology literature music art recreation government right so here we're harkening to america's origin story and how the expanding western frontier uh, of the Americas in the past was allegedly responsible for all of these benefits uh, that, that we get from present day American culture. And that it's just clearly obvious that expanding to Mars would continue this pattern. But, you know, uh, we also have advocacy, advocacy organizations uh, focused on Mars. So the Mars Society, their founding declaration, and they're not as big as the NSS, but they're still one of the, the more well known space advocacy groups in the space. Uh, and so they'll say that um, the settling of the Martian New World is an opportunity for a noble experiment in which humanity has another chance to shed old baggage and begin the world anew, carrying forward as much of the best of our heritage as possible and leaving the worst behind. Now, just imagine for a moment you're living in a society that sort of had this in their founding declaration. You're probably going to think you're better than everyone else, right? If, if you believe that your society was founded by the very best people and, and everybody else that didn't help was you know, part of the worst that needs to be left behind. So I worry there's a pretty straight line we can draw from what we're talking about space now to what happens in the expense. I'm not saying that's predestined. I'm not saying it's guaranteed, but it does seem to be a possibility that is well within the horizon. And that should give us pause because the expanse is not a happy universe. Now, 
this is another case where I could just give you example after example of, say, quotations and, and speeches of, of well-known space advocates. But please trust me, that this way of talking about space is so commonplace that it, it would otherwise not even be worth bringing. It's just such an ordinary feature of how Americans in particular and people that learn from America talk about space. But although this is sort of completely normal to talk about space in this way, it involves making just controversial claim after controversial claim, not only about our past, but also about our future. And the problem a lot of us have is we're not always in a great position to know when people are saying controversial things and, and when they're not, especially when we hear them from scientists and astronauts, people who we take to you know, only be speaking when the weight of evidence supports what they have to say. And I worry that we're a little careless. Uh, we're not careful enough, is a better way of saying it, when it comes to what we believe about space. And, and that really reminds me, and now we get into some, some philosophy ideas here, sort of really reminds me of, of, of one of the things that, that Alistair McIntyre, the, the ethicist, uh, stresses in his famous paper, The Recovery of Moral Agency. This paper has nothing to do with space, by the way. I'm applying, you know, philosophy ideas in, in, in novel context here, right? Um, so don't take McIntyre to be writing a treatise on space ethics is all I, I want to uh, say as, as a preface. Um, but, but he's addressing sort of this worry that people can be a bit too carefree in what they believe and that's how they decide based on what they believe. And he'll ask, you know, what's the effect of this kind of thoughtlessness? It's that individuals without being adequately aware of it are molded by forces uh, at work in their social environment so that their judgments express uncritically attitudes that they've never had an opportunity to make genuine of their own. They don't exhibit bad character so much as a lack of character. They're just not any more responsible agents. And what McIntyre sort of advises uh, for, for folks in this situation is that uh, they should spend some of their energy accumulating what he'll call in that paper self knowledge which I'm not a McIntyre scholar, so don't take my interpretation to be the sort of fundamentally correct one. But, but very loosely, I think what this idea is, it is just knowledge of the origin and context of, of our beliefs. You know, where do they come from? Why do we believe the things we do? Um, is it because there's evidence or is it because there's some other kind of story to tell? And so McIntyre is going to sort of, you know, uh, give us some advice for how to do this. And he's gonna give us some questions that we should keep in mind. Uh, questions like, to what particular influences are my beliefs and actions being responsive? Whose power is at work in making them responsive to those influences? And what are the distributions of power that determine whose power is effective and who's in it? Um, so basically saying, hey, we need to figure out uh, who's trying to get us to change our beliefs. How are they asking us to change our beliefs? Um, who benefits or doesn't benefit? Uh, whether we change our beliefs, does that actually help us out in the goals we have? Does it help or harm the people we care about? This is all information we should try to assemble if we're going to be really responsible for what we believe and what we decide to do on the basis of those beliefs, be it about space or anything else. Um, and just to pitch my own discipline, if, if you really want to sort of get good at that, the best thing to do is either major or minor in philosophy. A close third is at least including some philosophy courses in your undergrad education or or, or your gen eds uh, uh, in your associates. Um, those are, you know, best advice uh, is to learn how to, to, to develop the skills to generate self-knowledge, but not everyone has that kind of time. Uh, and we shouldn't be afraid to ask, ask others for help when what we need to figure out is new information that we don't necessarily have the skills to gather on our own. And when we have to rely on others for help, not just anyone will do it, right? It's a very basic premise of you know, critical reasoning and philosophy that um, expertise is bounded and just because somebody's really smart at one thing, it doesn't mean they're smarter at anything else. Um, and so if we really care uh, to find out, is it true what the NSS and the Mars Society say about America's past frontier and thus does that provide a good starting point for speculating about what might happen in the future, I don't think it's astronauts and engineers and, and NASA administrators that we need to ask about that. It's professional historians. Uh, those are the folks with the right There we go. Area. Thank you. <laughs> and so we're going to talk a little bit about history, but notice that we're doing so at the direction of philosophy. It's this philosophy that said, hey, on this issue, history is a good place to look for information. 
And so this is the start of a, a, a two slide quote. Um, and in this part of the quotation, the author is describing the view that they reject, just to provide that much context. Uh, but this paper is directed specifically at groups like the NSS that use the frontier metaphor in sort of, you know, um, identifying the virtues of, of Mars settlement and other kinds of space exploration. And so um, what this historian has to say is that heroic light pipe, so this is describing the, the sort of false history that she's responding to, uh, where heroic white pioneers brought civilization to the savage wilderness, they put the virgin land of the West to a higher economic use, they forged democracy in their, um, lost my place here, uh, in their simple equal pioneer communities, they fulfilled the nation's destiny, and they made their own fortunes, and then when the process was complete, when the wilderness was civilized and nature was improved into farms and cities, then around 1890, the frontier closed. To put it in a nutshell, we don't believe that anymore. Parts of the picture now look downright, uh, downright wrong. American democracy came from thinkers on the East Coast, not from humble settlements in the interior. The unsettled virgin wilderness was actually the home of indigenous persons, and in episodes like mining rushes, far more people failed than succeeded. So says renowned historian of the American West, Patricia Limbrick, in a what I consider the best space policy paper ever written, but also the hardest to find space policy paper ever written, Imagine Frontier's Westward Expansion in the Future of the Space Program. Um, so, uh, and I can say that uh, what Limerick says here seems to be representative of what other professional historians who have brought their expertise uh, to bear on the matter have to say. Uh, uh, another historian uh, in nearby territory would be Stephen Pine, but you'll also see this reinforced by uh, Roger Lonius, who's one of NASA's uh, former chief historian. So uh, I, I don't take myself to be, uh, you know, picking and choosing, uh, cherry picking historians. Uh, I may still be so, uh, but uh, I don't believe that's the case, if that was a concern that you might have. And this paper is very interesting because she goes on to talk about the frontier metaphor in depth. And a lot of the things she says are very philosophical things. And that's one of the reasons why I love the paper so much. Uh, but, but she'll talk about how this is kind of a dangerous metaphor to have, especially in the hands of space advocates. Because if your views about space are premised on these, you know, false but rosy views about our past, where there weren't problems to look out for, according to this frontier metaphor, that's not going to help us critically evaluate the things that are ahead of us. Um, if we believe that progress is inevitable, then we don't have to spend time worrying about the problems that occur because they'll just get solved eventually, right? Well, I think that's a very unproductive attitude, not only for the characters of the expanse, if that's their view, they're going to quickly find that they run into trouble, but for space explorers more generally, right? Uh, there are so many ways that things can go wrong, not just technologically, but economically, socially, politically. If we're not on the lookout for problems, we're not going to be able to accomplish the things we want to accomplish. And so we should try to avoid adopting mindsets that make us complacent rather than critical thinkers. And as she's calling for this sort of reconsideration of how we use the frontier metaphor, she doesn't think we should get rid of it. She thinks we should use it respecting the actual history of the American West. Um, but here she touches on an idea that I think is very deeply philosophically significant. And she says that the metaphor you choose guides your decisions. It makes some alternatives seem logical and necessary while it makes others invisible. Uh, and just think about, you know, when we talk about the war on drugs, well, that's a metaphor describing uh, sort of substance abuse issues. And when we declare a war on drugs, now drug addicts become enemy combatants, and it's only sensible to think about treating them on site as a solution to problems, because that's what you do with enemy combatants, right? Or at least that's among the things you're allowed to do. Um, but if instead we view drug addiction as a sort of mental health issue, then instead we would see drug addicts as patients and needing treatment. You can imagine, you know, how you set your task, how you define your task impacts what things you think are wise to do uh, in completing. And I think, you know, Limerick's describing what is an essentially just an intellectual version of the old aphorism, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But I say it's deeply philosophically significant because it's so similar. I won't say it's the same concept, but it's, you know, it's a close cousin things like Rudolf Carnap's idea of a conceptual framework or Thomas Kuhn's 
idea of a scientific paradigm. And I don't have the time to really get into what those are, but very briefly on, on paradigm. So Kuhn is saying something like, you know, different scientific theories, Einstein versus Newton, Ptolemy versus Copernicus, they're basically giving you these sort of different lenses, different windows into the universe that might reveal different things. Uh, and I mean, you could even say that, you know, basically we're just working with different Snapchat or Instagram filters here, that you're still seeing the same thing, you're still the same observer, but when you alter the path in between these things, uh, sometimes new and valuable insights uh, can arise. And so I think a lot of us are, are trapped uh, in a very confined mindset about space. And a lot of us are just going to agree with a lot of things as a matter of course. Like, of course, you know, settling Mars will eventually happen. And of course, uh, all the while, we're never going to prioritize anything other than cost cutting. And of course, because it's going to be so extensive, we need to rely on the private sector rather than governments. And of course, uh, that's going to mean that you know the people that are actually going to Mars or elsewhere are going to have pretty miserable lives because it's just going to be way more profitable if they suffer than if they're provided with the resources they need to thrive. And of course, it's only going to be the most physically and mentally able among us that are going to be invited along for the ride. And of course, and of course, and of course, no, I've had enough of that kind of talk. I think we don't really have a good reason to accept all of those things as a matter of course. Because they're only, of course, is under the status quo, under the, the sort of broad conceptual framework, the worldview uh, that uh, most people in the United States seem to fall under, which involves beliefs like the biggest problem we have is we're running out of resources and we can overcome those limits by going into space because there are basically limitless resources available in the solar system and what we can and should do is employ a free market system to sort of you know, generate value from them. And I'm not here going to argue against any of that in particular, but I will point out that there are arguments to be made against each of the claims I just made. Each of those things represent highly controversial claims, even if they're things that uh, you know many folks uh, haven't thought to, to question. Um, and, and what I want to impress upon you is that you know virtually everything we believe about space is just representing you know a single world, a single kind of metaphor. Of space. And if we're not impressed by the limits of how far we can get, if we're not impressed by what happens to people along the way under this metaphor, this framework, there are other possibilities. We're more than welcome to consider both alternatives within Western ideas about how to run societies and without. It, 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 it's, it, it's strange credulity to say we've even attempted any kind of fair assessment about what our future in space could look like. And so I want to, you know, make a very uh, modest suggestion about how to go forward. And we're very close to the end of the talk. Um, so as we're thinking about what kind of a future do we want to create in space, how are we going to do it? Who are we going to invite along the way? Can we find a way to prioritize ethics and economics, and not just economics? Can we find a way to prioritize human well-being and efficiency, not just efficiency? Because I think uh, when you start by putting sort of ethics as your primary task, that is when you're trying to come up with you know, moral duties and ethical obligations in isolation from other considerations, you're gonna have some very sort of basic and pure ideas about what you ought to do. And often enough, not all the time, but something that happens when you say, this is something I have to do, is you find a way of being able to do it. Doesn't happen all the time, but some of the time. And some of the times when you figured out, here's a way I could do this, you'll figure out a way to do it affordably, economically. So there are going to be situations where when we start in ethics, we can draw a line to economics. But we're going to get far less ethics done if we start with economics and let set that set limits to our horizon. So this idea that we have to hold ethical considerations hostage to economical ones. I just want to remind you, that's not a force of nature. That's a choice we've made, and we can choose something else if, if, if enough of us decide otherwise. So overall, I'd say we just do very well if we keep in mind some of the things that the expanse prompts, not only through its wider geopolitical stories, which I've focused on in, in this lecture, but also in any of the individual storylines. Again, I could have 
given a version of this talk about uh, any of the protagonists in the expanse or really any of the characters that become protagonists by earning redemption. Uh, they are all folks that can be characterized as ones that are committed to being open to new information and the possibility that that, that new information might require a change in even some of the most basic things they believe about their society and its place in the world. So we're all on the hook here. It will always be important for us to seek self-knowledge, whether we are contemporary United States citizens or folks living in a dystopian future uh, where some alien molecule uh, is going to do who knows what for the entire solar system. So thank you all so much uh, for being patient with our little not quite fire, but fire alarm emergency, and for uh, listening to my talk. And uh, I'm looking forward to your questions. Uh, you're muted, John. Thank you, James. While or Jim, sorry. While they type their questions in the chat box, and I'll read them back to you. Um, the, I would like to tell everybody that uh, you can find the expanse on Amazon. Uh, seasons one through five, uh, and they're in the they're almost at the end of season five tonight. Uh, they come out with the ninth of ten episodes, um, and it really is quite interesting. Uh, really, it is. And uh, I would also tell people, uh, students especially, that uh, the first season you it does a lot of setting up for the rest of the other seasons, so you kind of have to just stick with it a bit. Okay, um, one th I'm going to start with one question, Jim, and then we'll go to the questions uh, that, the, that the students and audience has. And the, the question that I have is, do you think that for good or ill, NASA has been our space agency? So do you think, how would you assess how NASA has done ethically in terms of uh, space flight uh, in terms of its travel to the moon um, and so forth. How, how have you given that much thought and how would you evaluate that? Um, I would say that uh, sort of the very specific point about, you know, do you give NASA a grade in ethics? I don't know that I'd be prepared to do that. Um, I, I know a lot of colleagues who would and I, I think there are serious reasons to, to worry about things that have taken place in the past and you know, how much they're looking for problems now in the future. And of course, we can point to some of the major things like uh, you know, Apollo 1, uh, Challenger, Columbia, these things where it wouldn't have been that tough for you know, uh, something to happen slightly differently that doesn't realize it. If only the sort of, uh, I think in the case of, of Challenger, it was you know, sort of upper management refusing to listen to the lower level engineer in us. Um, and so uh, there are cultural aspects um, uh, to that that you'd want to, you know, if you think there's like a virtue ethics kind of way of appraising this, you'd, you'd ask about, you know, how, how are NASA employees habituated to be on the lookout? And I, I will simply just not say I'm, I'm not qualified to talk there because I just haven't looked at the, the evidence I would need to say one way or the other. Uh, nevertheless, um, well, what I want to say is it's really hard for me to say anything about NASA in particular because uh, my experiences uh, involve working with a lot of folks from NASA, but more generally just people interested in space exploration. And my appraisal here is something like this, that um, there's a lot of openness to, to, to hearing perspectives, um, but there's not all that much that ever happens with it. Um, and so uh, is there interest in ethics uh, uh, among, uh, you know, sort of uh, space agencies uh, by all means, but are they happy with what ethicists have to say when they're invited to the conversation, <laughs> Sometimes, but not always. Yeah. And it's really tough to disentangle this for, from political forces because NASA, uh, although its main mission relates to science, it's still ultimately a, a sort of political organization in many respects. It's, it's led by a political appointee. And so its agenda is always going to be sort of moderated by uh, the federal government uh, and who's in the administration. And so it's just a really tough question for me to, to say much about, because I think there are very small, isolated versions of the question I could have really interesting things to say about, but it's just one where I'm 
I'm not sure anything I would say in full generality with, with how the ring is proof, you know? Okay. Here's a, uh, we've got quite a few questions. So just to answer them uh, as quickly as you can, I suppose, but here we go. One is, um, how do you balance, this is from Andrew Hoyt, one of my students, and how do you, he wants to know how you balance uh, ethics and economics. Uh, how, how can you be more specific on that? Yeah, good, good. Um, another one of those things where I've got, you know, about 10 different directions I could go to. Let me figure out what the best one is real quick. Um, let me just talk about, like, you know, space mining for a moment. Um, because I think that's a good example of why we might want to add some more ethics into how we think about this, or at least, you know, philosophical considerations, if not because of the other um, So uh, space mining, a lot of people talk about mining near-Earth asteroids for metals, uh, mining water from the moon, um, and then, you know, there, there's a bootstrapping that folks want to try to get to, you know, other destinations where the, the resource pools really open up. Um, and, and things are always pitched as, there's so much stuff there that we just need to get there, uh, and then all our problems will be solved. And the issue with that is when you start applying some sort of, you know, practical filter, when you start looking at the distribution of the near Earth asteroid, what orbits are they on, which ones in particular are going to have whichever resources, how much water is there on the moon that you can get to easily. Uh, so that there's uh, thought to be uh, some ice uh, frozen in the, in the permanently shadowed regions of the, the North and South Pole crater floors. Um, and so that uh, the lunar North Pole and, and South Pole are considered very attractive destinations because you've got uh, water you can basically just melt uh, and use uh, after you clean it. Um, so, so when you look at the things that are nearby and easier to get to, uh, the quantities start to get really, really, really small. Uh, and what you can get to at any given moment uh, is going to be very, very small. There was a paper that came out a few years ago that, that was saying if you were going to mine C-type asteroids for water from the near Earth asteroids, um, based on how frequently you can send missions out and how long they take, you know, maybe 70 tons of water a month to get from that endeavor. And, well, that's uh, going to take you about three years to fill up an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Um, and so even though there's a lot there, there's only a very limited amount we can access at any given time. And that, to me, thinks, or to me, thinks, that to me means... Uh, we can't get rid of a scarcity mindset, and that scarcity mindset really drives questions about trade-offs. What are the best ways to use these resources? Uh, and so I think ethical deliberation is, is very much needed uh, when we contemplate the, the use of incredibly scarce and non-renewable resources. Because if we're if we're not careful with space mining, and we sort of you know all the water we get from the asteroids of the moon just goes into you know. Uh, swimming pools for lunar or orbital hotels, and if we never make rocket fuel out of it, um, we're going to sort of run out of the nearby stuff, and it's going to be way tougher uh, to get anywhere further in space. So um, I think that ethics comes in not only in deciding what to do. Um, I think we ought to have ethical conversations about, you know, is space settlement something worthwhile in the first place? Um, but also how we do things once we've agreed on a, on a goal. And can the ethicist in this day and age achieve more than, you know, just trying to win over a few hearts and minds? Um, I, I'm a little skeptical of this, right? I mean, I think there's a lot of things about our, our social and political environment that, that are resisting uh, any push away from letting economics be the sole criterion. But I think for me, it, it really just involves impressing on people how bad things could go wrong if we try. And I know that probably didn't answer the question directly, and John, you muted it again, so. Sorry about that. This is from a psychologist. Uh, asked, I'm curious as to what uh, Dr. Schwartz has to say about the privatization and commod commodification of space travel. Um, I I am someone who, who sort of is opposed to that. Uh, it ultimately, it, there's an ideological component to it, um, but I think the most direct reason I, I find um, the great increase in private space activities concerning is that 
Um, there are long range consequences of some of the things we do in space, that things that somebody might do on Mars right now if they had the ability to go there or the moon could cause all kinds of problems in the future for other people that might want to be using those environments for other reasons. Um, once you go to Mars, uh, once humans uh, set foot on Mars, it's going to make it really, really tough to figure out uh, if there's any endemic or, or native Martian life because uh, Earth life is just going to sort of overwhelm and contaminate the environment. Um, uh, so there's a lot of science that, that sort of gets interfered with by uh, people that just want to go and mine the moon or mine asteroids or, or, or settle Mars. And I, I'd like to see that science be, be given more of a voice. Um, but ultimately, I think it's it's kind of a, a democratic principle that in, instead of all of us participating in a conversation about what we should do with the entire solar system, we're letting one or two people decide. A and that can't be a good idea, right? Um, those two, three, four people, there's no way, even if they're the smartest folks in the whole universe, there's no way they're going to be able to simulate uh, a democratic deliberation uh, of you know, why it's lost in human society. So um, who does space belong to? It's a question to ask. And we're going to have differences of opinion about that. Does it belong to whoever goes there? Does it already belong to all of us? Does it belong to none of us? Um, I'm really worried about people that would make the decisions for the rest of us. And there have already been cases of, you know, some things that have really sort of gotten under the skin of, of people that do research where contamination could cause problems. Um, and uh, there seems to be, well, under the previous administration, there was no appetite for, for giving NASA any teeth. Maybe there will be under the new administration. However, all signs point to, um, you know, the interest in uh, relying more on the, the commercial sector um, uh, for sort of space services. Um, and the long version of that, already kind of long responses, uh, I've got a book. Okay, the next question is, it goes going back to ethics, but uh, the next question is from an economist here at the college, uh, says, do you think the Chinese, uh, where ethics might not be a too top of priority, might have an advantage over NASA or the European Space Agency? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a that's sort of tough thing to think about because you've got to balance sort of, you know, cultural differences as well as, um, you know, different societal goals and, uh, you know, different ideas about, about how to pursue that. I'm a person that says, I don't care who's doing the thing as long as they're, they're doing the right thing. And, um, you know, where, where do I want to go with this? Um, so I, the, the geopolitical considerations are, are never one that we can escape, and uh, and this is something that, that, that Dan Dooley in the book Dark Skies that I mentioned a while ago, he really sort of impresses on the reader that you can't ignore politics throughout this. Uh, and I'm someone who, you know, it's part of my methodology to sometimes ignore politics to, to be able to make a, a very narrow philosophical point that's only going to work when certain assumptions have been made and, and won't necessarily work otherwise. Um, but what I would want to say is, why, why should we suppose that the, the Chinese are not part of this discussion in the first place? Um, why would we not include as many cultures as we can as we deliberate about what ought to happen? Now, we can't ever expect to reach consensus, but maybe some of the, the worst things could get taken off the table. Um, so I think there's always a benefit to getting together. Um, and, you know, I'm not worried about who does the thing as much as whoever's doing it does the right thing. And I don't okay. think there's anything special about any one nation in that regard. Hey, Jim, real quick, would you mind stop sharing your PowerPoint so we can see? Our oh, yeah, certainly. Screen. Certainly. I, I almost did that. Yeah. Here, and I just need to figure out how to stop. It should, you should be able to see it. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, you should, you should have a. Okay. Yep. Yeah, sorry. I'm, yeah, uh, there we go. First time in Web WebEx, I'm in a very yeah. Zoom uh, user interface search. Um, okay, this this is this next question is from a um, from a student of mine, uh, Michaela. Thank you for this question, and she says, "Do you think the type of civilization that we see in the expanse 
is really possible for our future? I mean, do you feel like it does pretty well in depicting that future, in other words? I'm inclined to think so, um, at least if, if the principles uh, that we use to organize industrial activity now are the same ones that are used in, in roughly the same way in space, I think we will see something a lot like the expanse take place. At least I think what we're gonna see regardless um, are, are things where people all do really struggle on a day-to-day -day basis to provision themselves with the necessary resources. And of course, when you're in that kind of position, you're very vulnerable to what someone with more resources might want to, to, to get from you. So I, I do think the expansion is, is a realistic projection. Uh, I, I think I mentioned this earlier in the talk, you know, it's, you can draw a pretty direct line there, but it's not, you know, there are branching paths nevertheless. And so I think if I were to try to, you know, draw a conclusion from my talk that's a little more, you know, putting myself at intellectual risk, because you might have noticed I was very, you know, didn't take a lot of risks in this talk, I didn't feel. Uh, didn't, didn't go out on many limbs. But, but one thing I might say is that I think what we see in the expanse would become less likely if, if we were less concerned about prioritizing doing things at the, the lowest possible cost. Um, because I think part of that is this idea that, you know, innovation is, is born of struggle. And so it's going to be a good thing that these people have to struggle so much. But um, that's not, a, you know, a, a law of nature in any way, shape, or form. Uh, sometimes suffering is just bad, and there's no value you can get from experiencing. So if there's going to be suffering in space, um, is it going to be, you know, productive suffering? Is it a very Nietzschean point there? <laughs> or, or not yet? So, I've lost the start of this question. Yeah, I think you basically got it. There's a comment as well that uh, water futures are now being sold on the stock market. And the, one of the audience members says that your mention of water made them uh, uh, think of that uh, and the caution that involved. Okay. Uh, and, and I would say that uh, water and oxygen, how the expanse handles that, uh, I think it's very, very honest about life in space in that way. But maybe independent of some of the other geopolitical considerations, I think that, you know, day to day, these are the problems you have to solve just to survive for the next day. I think it's very likely that life in space for quite a long time will resemble that. And you know, that's just the question then of what what is that what who's whose interest does that subject you to? Yeah. Okay, here's another question. Andrew, I'm going to come back to yours in a second because I've asked one of yours already. But this is from Dahlia uh, about Martian exceptionalism coming uncomfortably close to American exceptionalism. What is your view, she asks, as to whether we would even be able to make it into space uh, if we continue on with the divisive nature that exceptionalism seems to induce? Would we end up making the same political decisions uh, here, there, that we've made here, which have led to wars? Mm -hmm. That's not an easy one. <laughs> yeah, 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 you got to think about that. There are a few pieces to it as well. Um, I think it's right that um, you know any culture that has this sort of inherent belief in its own superiority. It's gonna be the one that really has trouble cooperating with others um, and getting others to help as opposed to forcing others to, to be you know, their subjects. As it seems like it's Earth and Mars are really you know, trying to just enslave the belt virtually. Uh, they, they kind of starve them out, you know, pay them just enough to keep living um, in order to keep, you know, in Mars's case, to keep mining more water so Mars can, can purchase that water. Um, so I think, you know, trying to move away from mindsets uh, where um, you're drawing, you know, moral distinctions between the, the value of one person versus another, irrespective of, you know, what they've actually done in the own, their own course of life, uh, that's going to cause trouble no matter what, right? Uh, and because space is so expensive, um, you know, it's much easier to do these things in collaborative ways. I mean, we would not have the International Space Station were it not for the international effort to create it. We would probably still have some 
some kind of space station, uh, but it wouldn't be as big. It wouldn't have produced as much research. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think in general, you know, cooperation is always going to work better than competition. Um, but how do you actually produce that cooperative environment as opposed to the competitive one? And here, here's where I always point out the irony uh, of the whole space advocacy culture to people, because we always talk about space as this chance for utopia, but we never even think about trying anything different once we go up there. Um, so, you know, I just want to say, look, can we give it a try? You know, if this is a place to experiment, let's actually experiment instead of just repeating the things we've been doing that seem to be repeating the problems again and again and again. Okay, last question then, and then will be done for the evening. And this is from Andrew, also a student of mine, said that he's seen the argument made that if a government uh, entity sends people to a place like Mars and then they can't return or they can't be guaranteed their return, that's not ethical. Whereas some individuals say, well, a private company that does that, it is ethical. So what what would your comments be on that? Uh, yeah, this is actually a question that comes up in, in ethical discussions about space settlements um, in terms of trying to uh, determine permissibility and what would it mean for there to be voluntary and informed consent uh, to go on like a one-way mission. Um, and I guess the best thing to do is just to maybe provide some green suggestions. Uh, there are two things that, that, that really, uh, two papers that, that uh, really kind of discuss this issue, especially with the private groups. So there's a paper by uh, David Kotzel in the journal Astro, I'm sorry, uh, the journal Astropolitics, one word, um, and it's about human subject concerns for the, the Mars One project, and it was published in 2017. That's a great paper to look at that asks questions about, you know, uh, autonomy and voluntary informed consent to, to, to essentially one-way space missions. And then um, philosopher Eric Person, last name P-E-R-S-S-O-N, um, he's a philosopher out of Sweden that also is part of the sort of space ethics community. There's a book chapter of his called Citizens of Mars Limited, uh, limited LTD period. And that occurs, that shows up in a, uh, in a volume edited by Charles Hockell called, um, well, it's, one of, it's in one of two books. I'm not going to, uh, it's either in Human Governance Beyond Earth or in Descent, Revolution, and Liberty Beyond Earth. If those sound like interesting book titles, um, they were interesting uh, books to, to write chapters for. Um, so, so I'd point your, your direction uh, there, because I think there's some interesting perspectives, especially what, what Person does uh, in, in that chapter is kind of compare uh, like a, a Mars company town to uh, some of the company towns during the, the sort of European um, uh, uh, invasion of, of the North America. I'm not sure what the best word would be is there but, um and it seems like you know well don't we know from the past that's kind of a crummy way to do things and, and it's really bad for the people involved and shouldn't we already know that's a bad idea um that's the essence of my response um but i think you know there's, there's some interesting arguments that that uh, cops will in, in person um, okay well uh we've been going about an hour and with our little uh break uh earlier and uh we appreciate your adaptability and i appreciate the audience's adaptability and flexibility that was not something that has happened yet <laughs> a fire alarm in the middle of the talk or at the beginning of the talk so i think we handled that pretty deftly good questions from everyone this session uh, has been recorded and uh, uh this has been great and if you have any further questions, you can send them to me at john.m.bar at lonestar.edu, and I can send them on to uh, uh, Jim, and hopefully he could uh, answer them. I might ask you to send me a couple of those uh, titles so that I could forward those on to everybody, if you wouldn't mind. But uh, yeah, just uh, yeah, write me an email, let me know what yeah. I need to tell you, and I'll try to tell it to you. I, I All right. need to make one more comment. Um, Space ethics is a very sort of new thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't want to give people the impression that I sort of speak for everyone that does space ethics. It, right. it, if you look into what other people have written, 
uh, both the philosophers that are part of these debates, but it's a very interdisciplinary crowd. We've got a lot of uh, policy folks, uh, folks from all over science and anthropology. And so it's a real, real interesting group. But a lot of other people have a lot of very different things uh, to say about space for me. So um, there are lots of other perspectives aside from the one that I'm offering. Uh, and I encourage you to explore that. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you as well from Lone Star College. We appreciate it. Have a good evening, everybody. Be sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like this video, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button to be notified about our latest content.